Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today on the launch of the Regenerative Agriculture Outcome Framework from Textile Exchange. My name is Beth Jensen. I'm Director of Climate Plus Impact here at Textile Exchange, and we have a lovely group of speakers who will be coming to you today um, to help us launch this important piece of work. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started, um, just to note that the recording will be emailed to you if you've agreed to receive our communications when you registered. It will also be available on our YouTube channel, so you can note that. Um, and as we go along, feel free to put any questions that you have in the Q&A box rather than the chat. We will try to answer live if we have time at the end. If not, we will also address the questions um, on the site on the hub, on the uh, Regenerative Agriculture Community of Practice site on the hub, which we will reference more later in the webinar. So I think that's it, and I think we can get started. So if we can move to the next slide, please, Sarah. And just to mention, and hopefully everyone on this call has already seen our Regenerative Agriculture Landscape Analysis Report that we launched in January of 2022. Um, that was really the foundational uh, report to sort of what we, what we called Stop the Swirl of all of the different sort of um, concepts um, uh, that were, uh, you know, kind of circling around in the industry related to regenerative agriculture and really try to provide a foundation for some of the key concepts, what we know and what we don't know. And one of the main things that came out of that report or one of the, the key questions that we got uh, on that report um, was around our definition of outcome base. So really getting needing clarity as an industry on what do we mean when we say that a regenerative agriculture program is outcome based. And so that's really where this work originated as a, a sort of a next phase um, following on to this initial regenerative agriculture landscape analysis report. Um, just the recognition that, you know, as an example, there are hundreds of different ways that we could possibly measure soil health, and also the recognition that what good looks like varies by region and production system. And so not only do brands need clarity on this to try to help, you know, cut through all of the different metrics and measurements that could be used to, um, to look at something in an outcome based, in, at a program in an outcome based way, but also as textile exchange, we really need this um, for measurement to be able to measure against our climate plus um, strategy. So we've always said that we want to look at climate um, impacts as well as the interdependent impact areas that are so important, such as biodiversity, soil health and water impacts. Um, we also need this um, to serve as a foundation for our uh, evolution of our standards work. So looking at, um, you know, more directly linking practices to outcomes and using the regenerative outcome framework where um, we're relevant to kind of set the foundation for what those outcomes uh, might look like. So lots of different needs for this. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Kelly, who is our lead consultant on this project, to talk a bit more about the intent with the regenerative outcome framework, this sort of phase two, adding on to the um, regenerative uh, landscape analysis report. Thank you so much, Beth. It is great to be here today. Great to have everyone joining us. Um, it has been an incredible pleasure and privilege to work with the textile exchange team, both on the first landscape analysis and on this framework, adding thanks to our sponsors for being um, true partners in this work. And I want to say a special thank you to everyone listening today and all of the others in the textile exchange community who contributed already to this process through the community of practice review and the expert review. You've already helped us strengthen this work immeasurably. So just to pick up on what Beth said. Our goal in this second phase was to develop a concrete guidance framework for outcomes and indicators for a fully regenerative agricultural system. And that's in keeping with the uh, definition from the phase one report, which really emphasized the indigenous roots of regenerative agriculture and the need to take a holistic view that incorporates socioeconomic and livelihoods elements, as well as ecological health elements. We aim to pull from and synthesize existing vetted frameworks as opposed to starting from scratch or recreating the wheel. There has been so much work done already on this question of indicators and so much great work to pull from both in industry reports and the scientific literature. 
And uh, we're aiming to create that common understanding and set of shared expectations, not to um, say that one is the, the ultimate, but really to have a, a set that people can choose from that is context adaptable and flexible for a range of cropping and grazing systems. Just a note on language, as Beth said, we were really trying to use the idea of outcomes in the OECD sort of continuum from input to output to outcome, and eventually to the very big picture impacts. And as we went through this project, I really um, ended up focusing on the term indicators. I think it is important to acknowledge that many of the um, items in the framework are really proxies for very complex ecological systems, soil systems, and human decision-making systems. You often hear metrics, and there's a few that couldn't qualify as metrics, but I think there are a number of others where that might give us a false sense of confidence in what we know now. So we went with indicators throughout the project. Just to recap some of those um, sources and models that I mentioned, I think these will look familiar to many on the call. Uh, sources as wide as ICEAL, very important work um, from the agroecological sector or discipline, including uh, the tool for agroecology, agroecology performance evaluation or TAPE from FAO. The um, OP2B framework from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, I think may be familiar to many. Very deep work by the Soil Health Institute already to evaluate a range of soil health indicators that we drew on extensively. And just um, really less than a little more than a month ago, we had the release of the first science-based targets for nature. So we've attempted um, even just recently in the last few weeks of this project to align the frameworks as closely as we could with that new emerging guidance. And on the right, the Delta framework, again, perhaps familiar to many, has also been a very important source of indicators and uh, past research for this project. Just to recap our process, uh, we have tried to make this as collaborative a process as possible, starting with that very detailed desktop review of existing frameworks. And in February of uh, this year, we took this into an initial review through the community of practice, Textile Exchange Regenerative Agriculture Community of Practice. Then uh, from March through May, we conducted a very detailed expert review with over 70 invited reviewers and 40 sets of detailed comments, aiming for a balance of stakeholders across um, sectors, across geographic uh, areas, crop and fiber types, and balancing expertise from a range of disciplines. From uh, the comments, we pulled in uh, 18 new indicators. So as I mentioned, this has already been greatly strengthened by your suggestions. And we're releasing this as a V1 today to emphasize our commitment to ongoing testing and evolution. So here is your um, high level graphic of the regenerative agriculture outcome framework. Just to highlight a few key points here, you'll see that there's quite an equal balance, again, between ecological health and the socioeconomic elements that I think have uh, received less emphasis in some previous work. And we also fully incorporate animal welfare into the framework. Uh, throughout this process, a key principle in the first report and this framework has been that uh, brands must collaborate and share the cost and the risk of the transition to regenerative agriculture with growers, farm groups, land stewards. We really want to emphasize as clearly as we possibly can that farmers and land stewards are not expected to implement the framework alone or to bear all the cost of uh, monitoring and measuring these indicators. So we incorporated a number of brand expectations and we've consolidated those into that section at the bottom that you can see. And our framework is based on the concept of a basket of indicators. You can see the little basket icons. Each one conceptually opens up and you'll look at, we'll look at that in the Excel in a moment, allowing for that flexibility and that context specific approach um, that we mentioned earlier. When we say the outcome framework, there's really a package of documents to help you um, hopefully be oriented to the material. You'll find a four page overview on the left that gives the high level context. The detailed Excel framework itself, which we are posting as a PDF on the website and which will be made available in Excel form on the hub. And a background and guidance document that gives detailed information on the um, uh, the units and the references and as much as we could locate on methodology or standard operating procedures for how to implement the indicators um, in, in the background. And this slide really just recaps some of the key points I've made, but I wanted to make sure this was included in the deck. 
uh, emphasizing that this is a fully open source framework, uh, reiterating the key principle of sharing the uh, collaboratively sharing the risk with growers, and that's reflected in some shared indicators that I'll mention in a moment. Trying to have this be applicable worldwide as much as we can and flexible, context adaptable. And again, noting that this is the basket of indicators, so there's not an expectation that projects would implement every single one of these by any means. This is set up to be able to choose the ones that are right for your project and then work further on baselining and implementing those. And Textile Exchange recommends that brands use this outcome framework as part of a broader three-step process gifted by VF Corporation. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. So I'm gonna switch this over now and um, take a look at that detailed Excel and just give a quick walkthrough of a, a hypothetical way of using this to create a customized indicator set. So bear with me while I switch over my share. Okay. So right now we are looking intentionally at a zoomed out version of the Excel framework. Just wanna give a quick tour and highlight a couple of elements. As mentioned earlier, the concept of shared responsibility between brands and growers is central. So you'll see the brand expectations section at the top and then the farm level indicators beginning just below. For each indicator, you'll find um, the outcome area, whether this is expected or however how many might be recommended from within a given basket. Details on the indicator, the unit, and the source, since this is fully open source and referenced. The stage in the causal pathway um, that I mentioned from OECD of input, output, outcome, and impact. And whether this is a brand level indicator, farm level, or both. We've also tried to give some sense of whether these are more basic, intermediate, or advanced. Again, so you can choose indicators that are relevant for your project. Or, for example, the level of access to laboratories. Um, so let me um, just kind of walk through a concept if we had a hypothetical scenario where we were working with a mid-scale brand and they wanted to um, implement a regenerative agriculture project with a group of smallholder cotton growers. We would um, have the scenario or hope that the brand and the farmer group would use this framework together to set, to set um, select their level of, uh, to select their indicators. And you'll note that there are four shared indicators at the top of each section to really reflect that collaborative approach. Um, they involve cost and risk sharing mechanisms, a strong collaborative process, a strong grievance mechanism, and when applicable, a free prior and informed consent with indigenous communities. Those are places where brands and growers should each have a voice in working together. So just briefly, if we have our scenario with a mid-scale brand, we might wanna skim down and I'll zoom in just a little so you can see the actual indicators now. We might wanna skim down as we evaluate these. We, we know the first few are expected and hopefully part of any project, but perhaps we can say that this brand is not quite ready yet to implement science-based targets for freshwater. We do include an expectation that brands would uh, conduct an initial assessment of a water risk for the project area. So we'll leave that one but we could simply hide these two that were not part of what the brand wanted to uh, begin right now. I've been opting to hide instead of deleting rows because projects can shift over time and there may be a need for different indicators or a greater level of ambition in the future. Just continuing with our quick example, we could say that in this project, animal welfare is not a central focus, so we can hide that row. When we move into the farm level indicators, we might want to say, for example, that this community uh, chooses to place a strong emphasis on women's empowerment as part of their, again, socioeconomic elements of regenerative agriculture. So they might choose to work with the women's empowerment framework that was developed by the Delta framework. And this more advanced additional one, they would hide as not relevant for them at this point in time. Going down just a little into the ecological health components. There are two sets of soil health indicators in the framework. The first comes from the Soil Health Institute um, uh, project that I mentioned earlier, where they have already vetted over 30 existing soil health indicators and pulled out what they call a minimum suite. They do require lab access for a couple of them, um, but they are designed to be as straightforward as possible for most growers. 
And we also drew on the FAO TAPE framework that I mentioned, Tool for Agroecology Performance Evaluation. And this set is, uh, does not require any lab capacity and is designed to be very simply conducted during a field walk with just a clipboard or a tablet-based um, survey tool. So for this group of hypothetical smallholder growers, we might choose to hide the Soil Health Institute set and just stick with the tape set, but we could go the other direction if we were working with a larger a group of growers with better access to lab capacity. We can continue in this way down the framework and uh, by the end, you'll come out with a more manageable set. There'll still be a number of indicators for most projects because we are dealing with complex and holistic systems but a much more manageable set. Uh, for example, here, we don't need to have any of the animal welfare indicators involved in this project. So we could hide those to end up with our smaller set. And we could repeat this process for any of a number of projects. For example, we could emphasize a project that does work with indigenous communities and is in an agroforestry system. Or you'll hear a bit later in the presentation from Alice working with grazers in South Africa, so we could choose some of the indicators that were more relevant for grazing systems. So I hope this gives you a very brief sense of how the framework uh, can be a tool, a living tool for systems in multiple contexts, and hopefully can that you can put it into use uh, for your project and align it with the systems that you're using already or implement it as you're considering a new regenerative agriculture project. I will return to the slides and I will give it back over, I believe, to you, Beth. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and just as referenced, um, we recommend that this regenerative agriculture outcome framework is used in context as part of a, a broader process, of course. Um, and fortunately, VF Corporation, in partnership with Peer Strategies, has been working on this broad on developing this broader process, um, as well as along with um, uh, using the regenerative outcome framework um, as part of this process. Um, and so they've generally uh, generously, excuse me, gifted us this process to be able to use and recommend alongside the specific regenerative outcome framework, which is really falling in stage two measuring. Um, so as you can see here, the recommendation is um, for these three stages. So practicing into measuring and then looking at optimal system function and how the system is performing. I'm not sure if we have Natalie Kaner from Peer Strategies on the line, but if so, um, yeah. I would turn it. Oh, great. Super. Natalie, I don't know if you want to say a few words about this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to. Hi, everyone. Glad to be on today. Um, so yeah, just to echo what Beth has already shared, you know, BF has been very deeply engaged in working with partners to source regeneratively produced materials and build new regenerative supply chains and recognize that there's a need to bring some consistency in how they're working with farmers and program partners across very different regions and contexts and materials. And so Peer Strategies, a consulting firm that I'm with, has been working with BF to develop this broader framework that we're really excited to share to you know, the textile exchange community and industry. Um, so it was built with this understanding that different suppliers can be at different stages of the regenerative journey. And we conceptualize this to allow farmers to begin with implementing regenerative practices, which can often be a more accessible starting point. But then the expectation, expectation is that they will progress to measuring regenerative outcome indicators. And this is where VF is indeed aligning their approach with the textile exchange framework and selecting indicators that make sense for their supply of materials. Um, and the key thing here is to be taking, you know, robust baseline measurements. And then from there, stage three is expecting farmers to take re-measurements over time of these outcome indicators and ideally be able to demonstrate that they're either improving ecosystem functioning or maintaining optimal functioning for their context. So really excited to be sharing this framework with everyone here and encourage others to adopt it, you know, potentially as an approach to help um, help farmers along the regenerative journey and structure how a company can measure and track regeneration in their supply. Great. Thank you so much, Natalie. Okay. And then, so moving on, I, I think we just have a bit of a pause. This has been a lot to take in. Um, so just wanted to 
sort of let it let it sit for a moment, let it simmer. And again, I see some questions coming in. Uh, we'll hopefully have some time to address those at the end. Um, so now the next phase of the launch webinar here is to hear from our project sponsors on how they are planning to apply the regenerative agriculture Regenerative Agriculture Outcome Framework. Good morning to everybody. I'm Gonzalo Pertile with um, Madewell J. Crew Group. Been in the company for five years. I'm very happy to share our learnings uh, with regenerative agriculture. So for us, regenerative cotton, it's uh, one of um, our biggest initiatives right now regarding raw materials. Um, about 70% of the footprint of our product is coming from cotton. So it's actually one of our most important fibers. And what we're doing in this space is that uh, in addition to already sourcing certified materials, we're also helping build a larger supply of sustainable cotton. In this case, what we're doing is that we are supporting growers transition from conventional agricultural practices to regenerative. And if we move to the next slide, we'll see a little bit more of um, how we actually structure this program. So we partnered with a um, consultant, an agricultural consultant, Braden Crossland, who's actually on the call also. And he helped us identify uh, growers in the US, uh, recruit them, train them, and then we're certifying um, their uh, growing practices against the region agri regenerative standard. And in order to help the growers make that transition, we're actually paying them a premium payment that is a, a per bale um, premium. That is something that we pay directly to the cotton growers. Um, it's completely decoupled from the price of the cotton. Uh, the rest of the transaction is actually done how it's normally done. We work with our spinners. Uh, we nominate where they need to buy the cotton from. And then the brand, those are Maywell and J. Crew, we pay directly that premium to the growers. Um, this is the third year. We can move on to the next slide. This is the third year that we are implementing this program. We're very happy to uh, with the results that we have achieved so far. Um, we knew that we had to make this commitment a long-term commitment. That's why we are actually... Um, working with the same growers for that three-year period, which is the time that they need to convert their land from conventional to regenerative. Um, right now, we have 26 different farmers in the program from different areas in the US, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, California. Um, and we're covering over 75,000 acres of land. Um, and if we move now to the next slide, we're going to be looking into a little bit more of, of the details of how we are overall approaching um, regenerative agriculture at J. Crew Group. Um, and we're moving away from what we called initially a pilot stage and now moving into implementing regenerative practices to a scaling stage and then demonstrating uh, measurable regenerative outcomes. As I mentioned, we started three years ago in 2021, very small uh, group of growers, kind of like testing how we were uh, going to build this program. In 2022, we moved to a, a proof of concept stage where we actually build the full um, model with um, strategic partnerships in our supply chain, uh, expanded into a larger number of growers. And then this year, 2023, we are beginning to plan what the actual uh, scale is going to be looking at for J. Crew Group. So adjusting our model for full scale, um, also identifying a portfolio of programs. We're not only gonna be working with the program that we developed at J.Crew Group, we're gonna look also at other programs that are already out there, um, which would allow us to source already certified regenerative cotton. Um, and then very timely, this report is gonna help us uh, actually determine what framework we're gonna be using to measure the impact of regenerative practices. So in joining the other brands and textile exchange in um, the outcome framework report, we actually also wanted to learn and take all of these learnings so that we could then plan how the next phases are gonna be looking for us in making sure that we're able to have measurable impact to the practices that we have already been implementing for the past three years. So moving on to 2024, we're actually uh, hoping to scale uh, our um, regenerative agricultural programs uh, and implementing um, an approach where we will be able to source um, um, cotton from regenerative sources in a much larger scale and being able to demonstrate, as I said at the beginning, those uh, regenerative farming benefits. Uh, so very excited to look at what are the next stage for uh, J. Crew Group. And with that, I'll pass it on to Agnieszka from Cotton Connect. 
Thank you, Gonzalo. Hello, everyone. Um, apologies for not being on the camera. It decided to disconnect, but I'm very excited to be here and represent Cotton Connect. Um, my name is Agnieszka and I'm a senior sustainability executive at Cotton Connect. And to those who do not know us, Cotton Connect is a social enterprise. We work with global brands and retailers, helping them source sustainable cotton and create more resilient and successful raw material supply chains. We took part in the first phase of the research, research and we are very excited to be invited to participate in the second phase and work on the framework. The categories presented in the framework are aligned with the regenerative approach of Cotton Connect. Um, our programs include the most important indicators that help assess the benefits of regenerative agriculture. But we just quickly wanted to highlight how we plan to use the framework moving forward. We truly believe that the framework has a huge potential to serve as a model framework for various organizations and bodies which are trying to implement regenerative agriculture into their programs. And this is because it allows to link regenerative farm management practices in the field with the environmental and social economic outcomes. And as you know, you cannot have the regenerative farming without addressing the social and financial issues farmers face. In Cotton Connect, uh, we are already tracking the relevant indicators in our programs. This is in line with our real regenerative code and theory of change. But what the framework is going to help us with is to further expand the data points we capture in our regular data collection process. This is an ongoing improvement process for our programs in order to develop more robust training and the framework will be a great guidance point. If we could move to the second slide, please. Thank you. What is also important for us is that the social and economic equity section brings the aspects which are relevant in the small farmer context in developing countries. So the issues around the child labor, the um, women's right, laborers' right, education, when is the right time for young people to start working, etc. Those issues are still present in the geography Cotton Connect is working, and it is crucial to address this when improving the livelihoods of the farmers. And lastly, we are planning to pilot some of those new indicators in our programs to see how easy it would be to capture this data and to include in our existing ME metrics. ME stands for measuring and evaluation. And of course, to improve the reporting. So overall for us, the framework is a fantastic tool and I hope it will be useful and widely used in the sector. So that's all from Cut and Connect. And I believe I will be now handing over to Sabrina from Kirin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Agnieszka. And, uh, and hi, everyone. Very exciting to be here. And as echoing what's been said so far, really great to see all the progress and all the interest in this, this regenerative agriculture outcome framework. We really hope it will help support more harmonized and even more robust ways to account for the positive impact of regenerative projects and then support the scale up of, of these projects. So I'll just, maybe if you can just move on to the next slide, I'll be really brief. I'll just give a very quick introduction from Karen's perspective on how we've approached impact monitoring for regenerative agriculture projects so far as part of the Regenerative Fund for Nature, um, and, and then the opportunities, of course, offered by this outcome framework that we're talking about today. And then I'll quickly just hand over to um, Alice Barlow and Bodla from uh, Conservation South Africa, who, and thank you, Alice, for being here, who, who speaks a concrete example of what this can look like for one of the projects that we're supporting as part of the, the Regenerative Fund for Nature. So as you know, this, this fund um, was, uh, was launched by Conservation International and Caring uh, in, in 2020. We're help, happy to have welcomed also Inditex to the fund this year. We're looking to grow it even further. Um, and so far, as you can see here on the slide, we have seven projects in the fund launched with our initial support across six different countries in covering um, four of our highest impact raw materials as, as calculated by our envir environmental profit and loss accounts. So leather, wool, cashmere, and cotton. 
and very much recognizing the challenges which are also behind the, all the willingness to build something like the, the outcome framework that we're talking about, but the challenges around defining regenerative agriculture, around accounting for outcomes. We, and, and recognizing the challenges, we, we defined from the start of the fund with Conservation International as, of course, the technical scientific partner, the five key impact pillars for the projects of the fund that frame really the impact monitoring framework for the fund and for as a whole and for each of the projects. So you can see the, the pillars here on the slides. We have soil health in, in which we also include um, elements around the water cycle, although there are always opportunities to improve this and this as partly why we're really excited to be part of this work, um, biodiversity and livelihoods, so impact, of course, for, for local communities, um, eliminating the usage of synthetic inputs, um, which is, is more practice related, but it's so connected to so many areas of impact that we felt it was really important to draw a red line and be really clear on, on uh, the, the, the need to go towards a, a transition towards that uh, elimination of synthetic input usage, and then animal welfare where relevant for projects that involve um, animal uh, grazing. So the fund as a whole, at a portfolio level, of course, we, we track the number of hectares on which we're helping to implement regenerative practices and the number of beneficiaries that are involved, but we're not necessarily prescriptive at this point as to the specific indicators that may be used for each project, because we know for each of these uh, impact areas, there is, uh, so much of this is so context specific that we um, we wanted, of course, each project to be able to draw a baseline and, and then um, evidence impacts, positive impacts against that baseline for each of these five pillars, except annual welfare where it's not relevant, for example, and, and, and really demonstrate that we're not only mitigating negative impacts, but also, again, generating positive impacts. Um, and and so again, it, it, this has been not not has, it hasn't been pursued so far. So there's so many different metrics and indicators that are being used by the, the the different project leads in the fund. And so we see great opportunity here. First of all, to also feed what has been done so far in the fund into the, the draft framework, but also to learn from it and and really continue to build this uh, yeah continuous improvement approach to to refine and make it even more robust. Uh, um, while keeping, of course, a context-specific lens that the way to the project of the fund are, are, are assessing their impact. And so now, after this introduction, I'm, I'm really happy to, as I said at the beginning, hand over to Alice from Conservation South Africa, who will go into a bit more detail on one of the projects that are being supported by the fund um, in some of our main um, wool sourcing landscapes in South Africa. So over to you, Alice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, clearly. Um, as Sabrina said, um, we are implementing a project uh, here in South Africa. That's Conservation South Africa, which is an affiliate of Conservation International. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of a sense of the context in which we're working. And of course, being Conservation South Africa, our, our mandate is, is to basically conserve and restore. And um, in the space where I'm working, which is in the Umzimvubu catchment, that target area where we're working is in a very strategic uh, biodiversity hotspot in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. It's also in a strategic water source area, um, an important uh, water catchment. And it's also in an area where there are uh, some planned conservation. There's a national planned national park and also a community protected area. And so the work that we're doing is in the buffer zones outside these um, uh, protected areas that fall under six traditional authorities. And the people that we're working with are uh, communal sheep farmers and, and cattle farmers with livestock that share communal rangeland. So they're not individual part, part, uh, um, farmers, but rather they are people situated in villages in these large rolling uh, rangelands that share um, those spaces, which makes it um, an interesting space to work in and, and, and sometimes a bit of a challenge. But in the space where we work, we we help um, working with the uh, traditional authorities as well as a governance structures that help in managing 
and implementing the regenerative agricultural practices with what we call farmer or rangeland, uh, farmer grazing associations or rangeland associations. In other words, groups of, of farmers in the community that come together and agree to implement regenerative agricultural practices um, in, in, in the spaces uh, where they are. And we use as tools um, to kind of guide this process, a tool called a, a conservation agreement where people agree to implement particular uh, rangeland management and restoration uh, prac um, um, activities and, um, and then receive uh, incentives for compliance to this, this sort of a contract that they sign as a group for um, as a, a conservation agreement. And in our landscape, we are hoping to bring by 2030, at least in this particular landscape, to have at least 30,000 hectares of communal rangelands under, um, uh, under conservation agreement and under regenerative agricultural practices. And it's important because those particular spaces are very uh, degraded. We have a lot of alien invasives, there's a lot of, of, of overgrazing and soil erosion and so on. So our work goes towards trying to restore um, those rangelands to full ecosystem function. Next slide, please. So as um, our organization, our, our goal really is to improve adaptation to and mitigation uh, from climate change in these very particular rangelands. Um, and our main goal is for there to be benefits for not only people, but also for nature. So in trying to uh, achieve this, uh, we look at things like ecosystem mitigation, water security, food security, human and animal health, and reduced uh, disaster risks, and of course, very important, improved uh, livelihoods. So what we are looking for in terms of the work we're doing is that we want to restore the integrity of our ecosystems in terms of their processes, its function, um, and you know, uh, having uh, water and also, uh, of course, increasing carbon and biodiversity. But we also want to have the people that are living in those spaces to be able to adapt, to have adaptive capacity and skills and resources that will better enable them to live sustainably in those spaces uh, where they are. So we do a whole lot of different activities, which unfortunately we're not going to have time um, to go into because we have a very integrated approach, but uh, we do things where we ensure that nature is projected. We also ensure that uh, we, we, we learn as much as, as we can from the spaces where we're working, um, share information, use different technologies. Uh, we improve, like I said, the adaptive capacity and governance related to those um, activities uh, that we are doing. Um, we give people improved access to market. Some of these places are very, very deep rural and very um, inaccessible. And um, so it is important that we give people uh, ways and means of connecting them to the economy so that they are um, also able to, to survive and have sustainable livelihoods. And then we also look into policies and things like that. Next slide, please. So our broad indicators as Conservation South Africa, the ones that we look at and the ones that we measure and that feed into our MERL dashboard, we have a MERL dashboard, which is um, monitoring and evaluation, research and learning, um, speak to areas well protected and managed, people benefiting, uh, species condition, and of course, um, tons of, of carbon dioxide um, um, stored. Next slide. In um, measuring, we 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 we, we um, are always measuring our impact because we have to report on it. We use a three tier system. We have people on the ground um, in, in the communities and our project staff uh, doing uh, ground based monitoring 
on all the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the different aspects of the work we do on the grazing associations and how many animals are out there uh, and so on and so forth. And we involve the community in making those, learning to make those measurements and to report on them and to understand them. We have a second tier uh, where we've got a team of people that uh, work with our information and, and analyze it and then feed it to the first tier uh, where we feed our information into our MERL dashboard. But on top of all of the information that is being fed from the ground, we also um, measure impact using um, remote uh, sensing um, uh, technologies. In this instance, we use Rangeland Explorer. So we're able to paint a full picture of the impact that we're having based on the different practices that we're implementing on the ground. And we're able to feed the information that comes from those uh, uh, particular measurements and evaluations in down to the bottom to feed back to the farmers so they know what's happening, but we also get information from the farmers and the communities on the ground to feed upwards so that it feeds into our system so that we can also report um, and share and so on. And next slide. And I think this is the last slide. So, we, we're using a similar a, a framework that is very similar to this, um, um, the, the, the regenerative outcomes framework. If you look at the two diagrams side by side, um, they are two frameworks. They are almost exactly the same. So really what I'm, I'm basically saying is that I've had a look at uh, this particular framework that is being piloted and tested today. And it aligns very closely to, to what uh, we are doing. And I think the only thing that I picked up on is because our approach is um, kind of one we're also looking at things like restoration. I picked up that maybe there could be a few indicators that could be added that speak to how, uh, you know, like, um, areas of land that are restored. For example, we've got a very, very big alien invasive uh, plant problem. So one of the ways in which we, we measure our impact is by, is by measuring how that land is, is being restored and so on and so forth. But I'm really excited about this regenerative agriculture, uh, sorry, yes, outcome framework. It aligns very closely with ours and it's making us have a very, uh, an even closer look at ours and our indicators to see how well they are aligned. But I think that it is a, a really good um, uh, framework and that people are going to find it very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice, and all of our speakers. Um, really appreciate it. And do just have to say, I think I missed one of the names, <laughs> Gonzalo Pertile. <laughs> Apologies for that, Gonzalo. Um, I was almost there, but um, but yes, thank you so much to all of our sponsors and speakers. As you can see, lots of different ways that the framework can be used, and um, we encourage more of that, which is a great segue to turn it over to Hannah from Textile Exchange to speak a bit about our plans or our recommendations, I guess I, guess I should say, for te testing the regenerative agriculture outcome framework and what the next steps are. Great, thanks, Beth. So, um, what we're releasing today is clearly a, a V1, and as we launch it, we will head straight into. We'll have a small, small break first. I think Sarah's definitely earned that. Then we'll head straight into preparations for developing V2 of this. As Sarah mentioned right at the beginning, the approach that we've taken to creating this version has been to really synthesize and build on existing frameworks, as well as the process of drawing on input from subject matter experts in the different impact areas. So to inform the development of V2, we're gonna carry on with this alignment work, but in addition, we're also going to focus on getting input from field testing at tier four by farms, farm groups, supply chain facilitators and project developers, as well as from brands that are supporting the testing process. So on the slide here, you've got a, a high level timeline for the sort of the next steps of developing. So we'll be spending the remainder of this year focusing in on the, on the testing. 
So towards the end of the year, we will start the process of bringing together the feedback, both from sort of open um, testing, as well as feedback from uh, roundtable working groups into a, a technical review process to inform the, the drafting of V2, which will then be followed by an open stakeholder consultation exercise. You can go to the next slide, please. So we're taking a, a parallel approach to the field testing. So one of them is, uh, is open testing. So we're, we've developed this to be an open source tool freely available for anyone. So we're also inviting all interested stakeholders to explore and test the framework and to provide feedback to help shape the, the next version. We'll be making an Excel version of the framework and a feedback form available through the Regenerative Agriculture Community of Practice Hub. Uh, in addition to making the framework publicly available for testing by anyone, we are also at Textile Exchange facilitating two roundtable working groups uh, to, to test the framework. Uh, one is focusing on animal fibers and materials and the other one on cotton. And I will hand over to Anna Heaton now, who's leading the animal fibers and materials working group to share a few words on the work that they will be doing. Thank you very much, Hannah. And uh, yeah, really just to build on what Hannah has just uh, explained, we are uh, doing some more focused testing of the outcome framework uh, in animal fibres and cotton. We've we've recently launched both of these. The animal fibres uh, working group is just uh, a few weeks ahead of the, the cotton group. Uh, and our aim here is to pilot and report on the menu of indicators and also to make sure that we haven't missed anything from our working group members if there's anything that they feel should be included that, that hasn't been. Uh, and it's also allowing then that the testing happening in different regions, uh, as well as we also have some different animal fibres within our working group as well, to really check the uh, applicability, ease of use in different scenarios. Um, and so we can take that back to our wider roundtable community. So our working group has got, uh, as I say, a, a range of uh, stakeholders engaged in it. And at the moment, we're going through the framework in detail, looking at the individual indicators. But the goal is that then we're, we will either have feedback from some members who are already using some of these uh, indicators and metrics in the uh, outcome framework. And they'll feed back into the working group. And also people will be taking up and trialing uh, new techniques that they might not be using already. So we can get some data coming in, look at the results and see how that's uh, all going. So uh, say some of these will be new metrics, new indicators for working group members to pilot. And those will be uh, some that are already in use. But this is just all part of having a bit more focused uh, approach to uh, targeting the testing of the outcome framework. Uh, and obviously, I'm sure people will be interested to know what, what the outcomes of those will be and how we're going to share that. Uh, and that's a good point for me to hand over to Zach. Awesome. Thank you, Anna and Hannah. Um, it's great to see everyone on the call and just really exciting to be at this moment of launching the outcome framework externally. So huge congrats um, and thank you to everyone involved. Um, so we just want to close with sharing that the main way to stay connected and involved with the ongoing implementation and evolution of the outcome framework will be through the regenerative agriculture community of practice. Um, so anyone not familiar with the community of practice, it's a global convening and communication platform for the apparel industry to cross pollinate learnings and harness the collective knowledge and influence of the group to scale regenerative agriculture. Um, so as mentioned by Hannah and Anna, there's going to be this targeted testing um, of the framework through the cotton and animal fiber roundtable working groups. Those groups will share report outs on their progress and lessons learned during our upcoming community practice meetings. Those meetings occur bi-monthly. Um, and so we included the community practice email address here. We'll also drop a link in the chat for the registration form. Um, once you're registered, you'll have access to the community practice hub site, which holds just an extensive library of regenerative agriculture resources and discussion threads. Um, and you'll also receive communications and invites to those bi-monthly meetings the next of which will be on August 24th. Um, so stay tuned for an invite for that. And 
really looking forward to continuing the conversations around the outcome framework through the hub site um, in the meantime. So with that, um, Beth, do we have time for a few questions or? I don't uh, think so. We're at 11.58. So I think we should probably wrap up here, unfortunately. I just want to reiterate something, though, um, from what Zach and, and Anna and Hannah were just talking about. We encourage anyone and everyone to test this framework and provide feedback. So yes, we're running a, a more uh, sort of a deeper pilot program through our roundtable working groups. Um, we only have so much resourcing available uh, for support, for that deeper support through those working groups. But our hope is that everyone is um, open to piloting this in the way that they see fit, um, testing this in the way that they see fit and providing feedback to us to go into the next um, version of the framework. So we'll want to continue to make sure that it evolves and um, is best suited for purpose for the industry. So I just want to make that super clear um, uh, testing the framework is not limited only to the working groups. We want to make sure that that's, um, that's happening uh, as broadly as it can be. So um, with that, I think we will wrap up, but thank you again so much to all of the speakers. This is a super exciting moment to have this uh, outcome framework out in the world uh, and really be you know, serving as a reference point for the outcomes we ultimately want to see um, out of regenerative agriculture uh, systems and, and practices. So Thanks to everyone, and um, we will do our best to address all of the questions that we can uh, offline um, uh, and post those on the hub. So thanks again to everybody, and uh, take care. <laughs>